maybe, maybe I should just um, start by um, sort of explaining why Mike is here, I suppose. Um, I, I had the great fortune to kind of stumble across Mike um, at Camden Arts Centre about a year or so ago when I was um, curating an exhibition um, it, there and um, Mike is on the, he's one of the trustees or board members or yeah, yeah patrons of the Camden Arts Centre and um, he gave me his, uh, he gave me his kind of calling card so to say which was a rather beautiful um, sort of card with an incredible image of a, a total, the, the sort of corona around um, a, the, the, the moon um, <coughs> the, of a total solar eclipse. And um, it, it was just at this moment when I had been invited by Oxford to, to start to ponder the, the issue of the, the transit of Venus. And so it was like this kind of, I don't know, lucky, th this sort of gift. And so we started to sort of communicate a little bit. And um, about uh, four months ago or so, I ha went and had a extremely long lunch with um, Mike um, in the restaurant next to his um, architecture practice. And... Um, mm -hmm. We, we produced, actually I should have brought it with me, but we produced this kind of, or Mike I should say, produced this incredible drawing on the, on the paper tablecloth, which he sort of gave me afterwards. And it's a sort of map of so much of the, the thinking behind this um, project in a way. Um, he drew, he'd been to um, Point Venus, of course, and um, in his sort of pursuit of... Uh, astronomical experience and um, made a beautiful map of, of the, the promontory there and made loads of diagrams of different telescopes and um, all in red pen of course and um, it was a real I don't know it's an incredible kind of boost to me in the in the in this rather sort of complicated convoluted process of, of making the film and um, I, I got a lot of um, it, it, a kind of the the sort of energy and enthusiasm of of Mike's kind of passion. I mean, yeah, he's a kind of uh, particular kind of polymath in a way, and um, as well as being a um, a very important architect, also since the age of what nine or something, you've been gazing at the heavens and thinking about that, and uh, and I think actually. The one of the stories that Mike told me was this, he should probably tell it himself, but it stuck with me, this, this kind of, um, his first experience with astronomy, where he, he was given some lenses by an over-enthusiastic sort of physics teacher and told to go and build a telescope, which I think he did with cardboard tubes or something. And then he strapped it to his father's garage door um, as a kind of improvised, I don't know, astronomical um, mount or something, and uh, started gazing up at the sky and saw this strange um, elliptical shape and he thought, oh my god, my telescope's completely wrong, I'll have to go back to the drawing board and start again, because he thought what he sh was seeing should be round and then of course realised that what he was seeing was the rings of Saturn and um, which of course was a kind of uh, epiphany, I guess uh, and uh, yeah so there are many many other stories like that but um, yeah, so it's really nice to have you here to, to um, sort of share some of your thoughts on um, the transit of Venus, but also just um, your kind of thoughts on the sort of your, your thinking around um, astronomy and, and its importance, I guess. Um, uh, th thank you, uh, Simon. It is nice to be here. Uh, and it was a great joy for me to meet Simon. Uh, because he has this wonderful property of being fascinated by linkages which aren't immediately apparent. And one of his wonderful artistic skills is to, is to draw triangulations between apparently unconnected things and see 
magic in the transitions and the linkages. Uh, and his exhibitions here, of course, <clears throat> also capture that spirit. Uh, we met in, in Camden Arts and then in the cafe, and uh, I love uh, speculating about astronomy, and we rambled over all sorts of exciting things. And it's nice to meet somebody who was also excited by the same issues, but from a completely different perspective, coming as it was from his research, uh, and my side coming from practical astronomy. I've been looking at the sky for a very long time. Uh, we had a wonderful lunch. Uh, as Simon said, we covered the, the tablecloth with diagrams and dreams and so on, and it was very nice. And uh, it's been uh, fascinating to watch Simon build this film, which is, as he himself says, is very dense. It's an incredible amount of information. Three or four layers of reading. Uh, the editing suite, uh, th the movie itself, the data that's being overlaid, the speaker, uh, and then sometimes the complexity of the image themselves. It's a very dense, complex, closely packed film full of knowledge, research, and sheer enthusiasm. Uh, and one of the things that links us directly, of course, is that I said I was going to go off to watch the transit of Venus, having chased eclipses for many years. And uh, he said, well, I might do the same. And um, it turned out that we were on Hawaii together, but we never ran into each other at all, ironically. <laughs> he went up the mountain and I went to the beach to observe the same thing. Um, but it was fascinating. And I just thought I'd bring along a few images uh, which just capture the feel of these odd expeditions uh, that I go on, which are in no way as heroic as Captain Cook's, but which have been a source of immense pleasure to me. And so I thought what I might do is literally just scamper through and I'll just move the table to one side uh, and we could turn off the light and assuming that we can organise ourselves. I'll just comment my way through here now. How to move forward, I wonder. The right hand button, left hand button, yes, OK. Um, very, very briefly, and I'm going to go very fast. Uh, you're all freezing to death out there. I'd hate you to die of cold in Vienna. Um, the logistics, Captain Cook, long voyages, scurvy, staying alive, going around the Cape of Good Hope. It must have been an absolute nightmare of logistical complexity to go to one of these great expeditions. For me, uh, modern aircraft, uh, sh relatively short time scales, Ironically, even as an amateur operating by myself and with my wife, there's still all the logistics of what you take with you, what you get on your aircraft, what you're not allowed to take in the hold. When I go through Heathrow, they think I'm a terrorist because all this stuff appears and rings all the bells on the security machines and so on. Um, and however small the expedition, there's still a little logistical challenge to go with it. And the expeditions, of course, are to, to places... People think I'm going on holiday, but I'm not. I'm going to wherever the universe decides the eclipse is going to take place. So I have, have no holidays in places I choose. I only go to places that have already been preordained by the universe, which in many ways is a nice choice. <laughs> uh, just, uh, just a couple of eclipses very briefly. They're never in convenient places, but they're all spectacular places. Um, this is just a quick glimpse. This is uh, in Libya, southern Libya. Uh, very, very difficult to get to, as you can imagine, because of the politics of Libya. It was in the worst moments of, of uh, the Gaddafi regime. And we got special permission uh, to go with a military escort south into the Sahara to see the eclipse. And uh, it was extremely spectacular. We left from Benghazi. We drove for seven hours in bitter cold. I had no idea how cold the Sahara Desert was at night. Um, and we arrived at this extraordinary notice in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the desert was elemental. Uh, half the sky blue and the other half of the earth uh, um, sand and a little notice saying observing point. And it was correct. It, was, it tallied with our GPSs. And there was virtually nobody there. And I thought, this is extraordinary. Only four hours to go to eclipse and there's nobody here. And, of course, it then became obvious. People came from all over the desert in four-wheel drives uh, in extraordinary circumstances. Oops, 
Sorry, whoops, sorry, going backwards here. Whoops, sorry, sorry, jumping backwards here. Don't know what's happened here. Can I go back? Uh, well, I'm looking at the arrows, but it's not, maybe it's, uh, no. I can't go back, I don't think. It doesn't seem to want to go back, unless there's an expert. Uh, yes, it's, oh, there, it's just taking time. Ooh, woo, 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 woo. <laughs> right, be a bit less enthusiastic next time. Anyway, the sun, which was the, the third element, sky, sand and sun, which is what we come to look at. And out of nowhere came literally hundreds and hundreds of people in four-wheel drives, not down the road, but straight across the desert. I don't know where they came from. I don't know that they went back to. And they started standing in lines. And it wasn't until they started kneeling and praying that I realized that this was a prayer meeting that I was at. I was there for scientific interest. They were there to worship um, because the son of Muhammad died during an eclipse and therefore many Mohammedans pray at eclipse sites for that reason. So it was quite surprising for us. We'd come as, sci as amateur scientists, as it were, and you can see the general organization of the desert. Um, there's this crust which you can break through, so I made little sand feet to make sure the telescopes wouldn't dig into the sand. And where people weren't praying, there was a scattering of people. And the really fantastic thing is the anticipation. Notice the difference in the color of the sky. Uh, the second photograph was taken as the sky was beginning to go coppery as the eclipse commenced. And the great power of these things is the extraordinary anticipation. So the moon is visibly crossing the sun uh, and you can watch it happening. You're beginning to see the rotation of the solar system in front of your eyes. It's quite a powerful physical experience and it gets finer and finer, uh, the edge of the sun. Uh, and you look to the southwest and you can see the shadow of the moon racing towards you, which is quite extraordinary. The shadow of the moon is about 60 miles across 100 kilometers across, and you can see it coming across the desert. It's quite hair-raising. And then, of course, the last glimmer of sunshine disappears, and wham, you get hit by this incredible image, which is the solar corona uh, blazing out from behind our moon, which is just large enough to cover the sun. It's quite extraordinary, and it's very short time scale. It lasts, in this particular case, it was 3 minutes and 20 seconds, that's all of this blazing light, which is changing its form all the time. And, and remember, the moon is moving, um, and the Earth is rotating as well. So nothing is stationary, and you're aware of, of the brightness on one side, and then the brightness on the other side. And then it, it blazes and blazes, and then suddenly it's gone. And you get these extraordinary moments. Here's another one. I decided to go to an eclipse in French Polynesia, uh, in a place called Heo, and I looked it up on Google, and this is what came up on Google. I thought, my God, I'm going to about as far away as you can possibly get from anywhere on the planet, and it turned out to be true. It's about the most inaccessible place in terms of distance from any major continent. It is spectacular. I looked it up again, and I thought, where is this island? And I realized it wasn't an island. It was just an atoll. It's just the top of a volcano sticking up four or five meters out of the sea. It's a hundred kilometers around, and it's made up of tiny fragments of land just hanging on on the edge of the waves. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, it was not long after the tsunami in Indonesia, and I thought, maybe I'll never come back, uh, because if the tsunami decides to roll across here, you're a goner. But in the end, uh, I was assured that on sea mounts, and this is the top of a mountain, of course, it's an undersea mountain, this is the top of a crater of an undersea mountain, then a tsunami just passes you by with only a few centimetres rise. So you, it's only when it meets shallow water that it becomes dangerous. So I was assured. The other thing to notice is the clouds. The Pacific is a huge moisture generator. It's one of the world's great uh, cloud builders. Now then, here we go. And this is, again, the site for another eclipse. This is the coral beach of the island of Heo. Uh, which was a fantastic spot for an eclipse, completely different than the Sahara. Than the Sahara. Uh, very nice. And this is the 
just pre-eclipse. Uh, my equipment here, again, logistical problems. You've got to cart this through airports and so on. You pick a site, and I tucked myself into the trees because it was quite windy, and I didn't want the telescopes to shake as I was photographing the sun. Again, amazing moments of anticipation. It's very quiet. Everybody goes about their business, and the birds start going odd, and everything stops. And it's quite extraordinary. And you put the image of the sun in the telescope, and you wait. And then you realize that it's not round. That on, at 7 o'clock, there is a little nibble of the moon beginning to creep in uh, across the sun. And it gradually creeps across. And then, again, blazing of a completely different corona, because the corona is changing all the time. Very spectacular again. Always amazing. And as you take different exposures, it blazes more strongly and more strongly. And you can see at high power the prominences flaming off the edge of the sun through the telescope. And this is all live, and it's all moving. It's most dramatic. And then the last moment, just as the sun breaks through, it was a very unusual photograph. I couldn't possibly reproduce it again, uh, where the cloud in the foreground suddenly came over and is illuminated by the blaze of the sun just peeping out from behind. Then, like Simon, I, I thought, well, I can't go to this part of the world without the official visit. Uh, and again, this is uh, Captain Cook's wonderful sight. This is his view. This is what he was looking at. They anchored in this bay, um, and they built the fort that Simon's film described so well, uh, the Black Sand Beach. And they did record, but with great difficulty. Uh, and their logistics, of course, compared with mine, would have been phenomenal. So in that sense, it was, it was rather nice. But it's a beautiful place. Uh, of course, it's now inherited by the locals in every way, as it was at the time. And of course, it was there for several thousand years before any European ever uh, discovered it with its own culture and so on. And note that Simon's film emphasizes the word discovered by the Europeans. <laughs> Uh, of course, it was visited by other well-known films, uh, ships for films, <laughs> the mutiny on the bounty. Here's another extraordinary eclipse in an uh, extraordinary location. This is London, my office. Would you believe it? In 2006, the first of the two great transits of Venus of this cycle occurred and was visible from London. So I was able to photograph it on the lawn of the office, which is on the River Thames. So this, logistically, this was very easy. Uh, here's a photograph of the 2006 transit of Venus. And not quite the black drop. There wasn't that much of an effect here. But it was a privilege to see this because they only occur every 115 years or so. Uh, and they come in pairs eight or nine years apart. And I was lucky to see 2006. And I promised myself that before I died, I would try and see the next one in 2012. So off again to another wonderful location, uh, Hawaii uh, and Mauna Kea, which Simon, in parallel to me, was going to. Uh, again, logistical kit, this time more complicated, determined to get better photographs and all the rest of it. Also traveling with different kit, hydrogen alpha filters and very exotic stuff. Uh, again, trouble with the customs and immigration and the security. Uh, and beachside locations. The interesting thing here is the orange bag, which you see all the time. That is the counterweight, because you're not going to carry two or three kilos of counterweights from England in a bag. You just pick up stones from the beach or up the mountain and put them in your Tesco bag. <laughs> it still works. Uh, here Now, one of the things that happened, of course, was that we saw three eclipses in two weeks, one a transit and two eclipses. And this was the middle one, in fact, which Simon also photographed, which was the um, partial eclipse of the moon. And this occurs two weeks exactly after an annular eclipse of the sun, which is what I end this presentation with, in fact. But one of the things that's fascinating is the scale. You can see the shadow of the Earth. This is not the normal shadow across, this is not the shadow of the sun. This is the Earth's shadow creeping across the moon from top left to top right. And here's a different photograph from a different eclipse where again you can see the partial uh, covering of the moon 
And what you're seeing there is the relative diameters of the Earth and the Moon together. And then, always spectacular, a total eclipse of the Moon. You're entirely in the Earth's shadow, which, which filters out the blue and lets the red through around the Earth onto the Moon, which is just wonderful. And then from there, up the mountains, Simon was way up on the top and I was down at the beach on this very spectacular island. Simon was even higher than this photograph. This photograph is taken from about 3,500 metres. And in the background is the largest shield volcano on the planet, Mauna Loa. And Mauna Kea, on which Simon was, is the tallest volcano on the planet at 32,000 feet uh, from the bottom of the sea floor to the top. Um, and it's so heavy that the sea floor around Hawaii has been depressed by the weight of these incredible volcanoes, which of course are still live. And again, uh, there we have uh, uh, my little sequence, which I'm deliberately hopping through rapidly. I changed into hydrogen alpha light, which is a different sort of filter, which allows you to see prominences and so on. Uh, but that was uh, an enjoyable experience, photographed by a very large number of people, uh, including Simon's beautiful film there. And then finally, uh, in, which happened in fact before, but nevertheless an equally spectacular occasion, far less photographed, very spectacular because it's physically, almost viscerally, a measure of the rotation of the planets together, uh, is this place in Utah. We photographed from the top of Bryce Canyon, which is one of the most beautiful places in America. Uh, the high plateaus, the Aquarius plateaus, highest plateau in America, Bryce Canyon right next door. So we were on the rim photographing the annular eclipse. And the annular eclipse of the sun is an eclipse where the moon is not big enough to cover the sun, which is much more new. So you don't get a total, you get a completely different set of effects. And again, uh, you notice that it's not quite round. So 